Hello and welcome to Digging for the Truth with Ark and Neo. This is episode number 16, and tonight we're going to get back into the Raj Niche discussion. Pick up where we left off last time. We had a couple surprise episodes come up, bonus episodes, in which we had the ability to talk with Kent Hoven recently, and we're happy to have the opportunity to do that. But we want to get back on track and at least uh, finish this part two of this podcast as well. So kind of amazing the set of circumstances that came together where I was able to talk with Kent. Um, and you'll hear at the end of this podcast, which was recorded before I ever knew that I was going to talk with Kent, uh, that Neo brings up, uh, hey, you know, Kent's case is coming up. We should be praying for him. And it was after we recorded that that I had gone online kind of doing some investigation and uh, and sent off a note at 2peter3.com uh, just telling him about the music and, and wanting to know if I could ever help out in any way and dropped my number. And next thing I know, I got a call from Kent Hoven. So uh, it wasn't planned and didn't know it was going to happen. We're going to get back into this discussion about the Raj Niche. This is an amazing account, and Neo has a lot of information that he'll drop as far as the details uh, about it. So let's continue where we left off with... Uh, the Rajneesh, but first a little word from our sponsors. Are you a truth seeker? Do you like hip hop? Are you interested in the mysteries of mankind and nature and asking all those life examining questions and demand answers? Then it may be your destiny to check out Destiny Lab at destinylab.com where you'll find music that glorifies God and exposes the very roots and the lies and deceptions that we face today. Issues like creation versus evolution, aliens and UFOs in the spirit realm, the fallen angels and the Nephilim, transhumanism, the new age, the occult, the Illuminati and the new world order, and how all these things tie into one cohesive story and one ancient plan that is explained in the word of God. Three CDs are currently available at DestinyLab.com. 54 songs in all for only $25. Stay tuned for our fourth album which is in the works now, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Destiny Lab, and consider giving a love offering to Michael Myers Video Ministry, who creates all of our amazing YouTube videos. And now, back to Digging for the Truth with Ark and Neo. You know, basically, the, the problem started with land use laws. They again. They wanted to build a city in the middle of nowhere, but that was um, land that was uh, for farming, and so they tried to get, mm. you know, um, uh, they tried to work, work with, within the law so they could build homes and buildings. and And she met with the Wasco County planners in the summer '81 to try to uh, figure all this out. And, and she was actually married by a New York banker named John Scheffler. Uh, who is named as who is called Swami J? <laughs> is he a rapper? <laughs> yeah, all men were called Swamis, and the females are called uh, uh, Ma. <laughs> so <laughs> mm. I don't, I still don't know what that means. But anyway, and uh, they also had a, another head guy named David Napa from California. He was a therapist, and he was known as Swami Krishna Diva. So, <laughs> and they were kind of the the educated ones, they spoke very well, and uh, they would go to town wearing plain clothes. They wouldn't use their names given by the Bhagwan. They would use their real names, so they were just trying to make things seem like, hey, we're just simple farmers. We're not here to do anything different. And, you know, that's what they told the people that are going there, too. You know, this is going to be a commune farm. Sure. And, um, but the problem was more and more kept coming, you know. First there was, you know, 20, then 100, then 1,000, then 2,000, then 3,000. And they just kept building these big buildings. And they were saying, well, you know, you, this, you can't house more than this many people here. So they said you could legally house up to 150. And they were within a month already over that. Uh, and they kept asking, are you guys a religious organization? He goes, nope, we're not a religious. We just celebrate life and laughter. We are simple farmers. <laughs> that was your announce. So wow, well, that's fascinating how it how it attracted such rich people. I think that kind of created the snowball effect 
of uh, the trust fund kids and different people just had a lot of money and a lot of time, you know, that they didn't know what to do with. And it's kind of like these people today. It really reminds me of these people that go on these DMT trips because that's that's not something that most people can afford to do. You know, go off to Peru, you know, uh, to take a DMT trip with with shamans. That you got to pay, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to, to do so. Uh, it seems to like kind of appeal, like you, you've said lots of times, to this rich, elitist type personality. People that think they're part of like a, uh, a special crowd or, you know, the who's who. And that seems to be this, you know, appeal to the ego. That's what's so ironic is a lot of these people are always trying to remove their ego. But it seems so clearly that that's exactly what they're driven by is their ego. <laughs> you know, I mean, what's oh, her yeah. name? Yeah, especially the ones that are given power. Yeah, uh, or Sheila Silverman. She she has this quote where she described uh, herself as a, or described the area as a, an oasis of intellectuals creating paradise on Earth as an example for the rest of the galaxy. Yep. You know, it's like how egotistical oh, yeah. does that yeah, sound? Yeah. You know? Egotistical and condescending yeah. to the, you know everybody else who's not at her level, you know? Well, she was used to getting her way um, because after they couldn't get things rezoned, they basically wanted to create a city that they wanted to incorporate so they could build a city there. Um, and some Oregonians uh, um, kind of in, uh, talked to a group named Thousand Friends, which was a kind of an environmental group, um, and they were going to try to stop them from building a city there. And Sheila tried to bribe him with a substantial bribe, which they didn't take because it would have, you know, because that worked in, in, in uh, India all the time, just bribe people and you could get whatever you want. But uh, apparently sure. it didn't work here with these guys. So, uh, and that's what really got her angry. And um, she had outrageous uh, news conferences after that. And then this is kind of what I remember as a kid watching these, news conference with Sheila just going nuts and just cursing and but being very uh quick witted and having a smile on her face and, and you know, great communicator. Um but also yeah. <laughs> would you know kind of master yeah, manipulation. Master manipulation, exactly right. Um so but they kept at it. They uh they were thinking of all kinds of ways to keep this dream alive uh, of how this you know this this giant city of uh, this oasis for these uh, devotees the bhagwan could be uh you know come to come to be yeah man now one of the things that happened was that even though they couldn't get the ranching done they couldn't do any of those things they kept uh they kept trying to uh make this happen so so they kept basically trucking in more and more people. And these people, they they didn't have nice accommodations. They they worked seven days a week. They shared meals in, in places that resigned were for four people. And they'd sometimes sleep 12. There'd be no running water, no toilets. Um, and that's how they housed so many people. They just have uh, mattresses on the floor. And um, many people bought their own stuff. But they would just give them to the Bhagwan. You know, a guy who drives a Jaguar in, and the next thing you know, it's uh, it's uh, the Bhagwans. He just gave it up to him. Man, I mean, that's what I don't understand. It's like, you know, you put yourself in such conditions. I mean, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it just seems strange that people, so many people, would fall for it. Yeah. Well, and like I said, they had this Hollywood group, is what it was called, and Sheila immediately split them up because they, she didn't, she feared that since they were very rich and they were already getting the better conditions, the better housing that they would, uh, try to usurp her power. And, um, so she mm -hmm. split them up. So this is when Sheila started bugging everything. She put uh, hidden microphones, recording equipment all over the commune so that she could yeah. figure out what was going on because you can already see that she's getting, um, you know, <laughs> she's having some, uh, anxiety over over the other people because she wanted the power she wanted to be the top dog of everything well and she, didn't she basically only work with an inner group of, of just women that ran the entire place yeah i mean her husband was part of it but she was he was he really never spoke and there was another guy uh 
you know, I mentioned earlier that he wasn't really much of a speaker, but I think they were a, gave their expertise because one of them was a, a banker and one of them was a, a, a lawyer. So they gave their expertise on the law, but she did all the talking. So anyway, they, you know, there was kind of a, this came to a head and, and some of these richer people, they thought that they were the, the heads of the commune because they were able to just buy their way. But she basically told them, nope, you're not, I'm the head, and if you don't like, you can leave. So she was very aggressive, you know, verbally towards these people, and um, she eventually kept her power, and these other people just kind of faded away or left. Yeah. So, you know, here's where it gets weird, though. Um, crazy things started happening. Yeah, because it it's not weird yet. Yeah. <laughs> What happened is that, that uh, there was a call from a guy named Bill Hulse. He was the Wasco County Commissioner and a wheat rancher. And his wife, Rose, Rose uh, was panicked because two Rajneesis had driven up their dead-end street in Dufer, Oregon, parked across from their house and sat there one hour, two hours, four hours, just sat there and just watched them. Hmm. So Hulse called the police, but, he, but the police told him, hey, you know, they're on a public street. What they're doing isn't illegal. So they started to try to intimidate public officials that were stopping them from building this city. So they would just park. That was their job. Your job is to go and watch these people all day and yeah. then do it. It's like um, Scientology methods. Yeah. Intimidation. And so they, they're exactly right. They were using intimidation. Um, they uh, they made no apology about this. They said, that's what we're going to do. We're going to intimidate them. We, w we just want to be left alone. And they they basically cut off the road. They would they put a giant truck in front of the road so nobody could get in, and they just move it anytime they wanted to get out. And if the police came and says, "Wait, why is this road closed?" They go, "Oh, I don't know. I think somebody just ran out of gas here." And they kept saying that over and over again. <laughs> so nobody could ever get into the commune. There's only one road in, and so they just shut it down whenever they wanted nobody to come in. And they got away for that for a long time. But then the police started firing. Uh, flying helicopters over there to see what was really going on. They noticed that, man, there's a lot more buildings and people living here than we uh, anticipated. So, you know, this is just a few years after the uh, the Jim Jones, you know, deal with the cult where he had all those people drink the Kool-Aid. And uh, Vicatillo was the governor of Oregon at that time, and he, he was actually uh, counseling to the Oregonians having tolerance because there was getting to be some you know, some concerns about these weird orange people, you know, <laughs> people weren't orange. So, oh, yeah. And he wrote a letter in the, in the Oregonian that said, regardless of the religious beliefs or practice of this group, they are entitled to every right effort under our constitution. And my duty is to protect those rights. And, yeah. and he was right. You know, they were, they hadn't broken crimes yet and, you know, but they were getting more aggressive. And so, Again, they start off with just intimidation just by being around, you know, just being creepy, you know, filming people, taking pictures of them, just kind of just parking there watching, you know. Oh, weird. Uh, but then it grows. So another guy named Dan Duro, he was the Wasco County Planning Director, and he was close to those front lines, and he decided almost daily what the Rajneeshis could and couldn't do because they would come to him and say, hey, we need to get a permit for this, and he would be the guy who said yes or no. And... He was getting very suspicious since they uh, lied about their first intentions with him. They said, you know, it's just going to be a farm, but, you know, that's not what they were doing now. Now it's they want to have a city. And um, so he had to watch them. So he was trying to go to the law, but he was also pretty concerned of what they were doing. And the Rajneeshi lawyers, they were, you know, pretty sharp. Yeah. You know, they were, they knew the law and they were taking every advantage of the law to, to allow them to build and to keep these things going and keep the land use rules in their favor. Mm. Um, so what happened? This guy, um, again, they put, they had these deliberate breakdowns to, to stop people from getting there. And basically what happened to this guy is that uh, they, they retaliated in, in kind of petty ways. In one way, they put a nail under the tire of his car. So that he got a flat tire, but you know he had guys just follow him around, hmm. and they uh, they had the 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 guru's top aide would just hold the court 
court door open for anybody that came in all day, just would be there, you know, all day, just in the courtroom, you know, not saying anything, <laughs> just there. And <laughs> man, they just had enough people that they just, you know, started. It sounds like, you know, in such a small town, you, you just through, through intimidation, it's like mob mentality or mob tactics of the mafia. Yeah. You know, you just bring in the strong arm to, uh, to intimidate people. Yeah. Even and, and one time they, <laughs> they were going into the court and, uh, Ma'anad Sheila, uh, as he was walking with a, with arms full of books, stuck out her leg to trip him, and he fell down with all the books. They all started laughing at him, you know. And then she just laughed wow. at him and said, "Ah, you know, just you know, dumb little kid <laughs> stuff." But you know, tripping him, seriously tripping him, <laughs> man. So you're doing everything, and how enlightened of her. Oh yeah. So, and then the attorney general of Oregon, the guy named Dave Frohmeyer. Uh, he was called and kind of been, been aware of the things and he basically, uh, said that their, uh, application to be, to become a city is illegal. And he said, there's no way you're going to let these people make a city there. And so Sheila went to different, uh, different avenues because they had millions of dollars that they had already invested in this. I mean, just, you know, they wanted this to be a huge commune where people from all over the world would fly in. They wanted to have a, um, uh, an airport there at one time. Mm. And so what she decided to do was to set up uh, secret squads to uh, strike at all the commune's enemies. And these are all the disciples who, who accepted Sheila's view. And she, she was the basically the spy master. She had different uh, compartmentalized minions, ones that would go out in small teams, unaware of whatever the other groups are doing so that nobody could kind of spy on the other ones. And their first thing that they did... So she was like the mob boss. Yeah, she was the mob boss. Is they wanted to poison... Uh, they wanted to poison someone. So that was their primary poison. And it was crafted by somebody named Ma Anad Puja. And that was the nurse uh, who was then known as Diane Onag. I think she's a Filipino-born lady. And she had been Sheeta's shadow for uh, mm. since they had been at the commune. And... So she was kind of the the ranch's medical department expert, and she did the routine medical cares and that kind of stuff. So she devised some kind of a poison, and she was going to poison some people. Mm. And so they put her in a separate cabin, and she was there to brew her uh, and experiment with different viruses and bacteria. Because, see, Sheila wanted something that would sicken people and not kill them. Wow. She really didn't want to kill people. She just wanted to get people sick. So in the summer of 1984, the, the, this puja lady field tested her work. And so she had a bunch of vials and the secret teams uh, took this and um, gave these little brown liquid vials of salmonella, which produced severe diarrhea and other symptoms. And they actually spread this in a town called the Dalles. Really? And over 700 people got sick from eating food at several restaurants where they had sprinkled it over salad bars and napkin holders and different things like that to spread this poison. And this is actually still the largest uh, biological attack on U.S. soil to the date was this Rajneeshi attack where 700 people were, were sickened. Not, luckily, no one died. Man. So is that just a test they were doing just to see if it worked? That was a test because, see, their ultimate thing was to – uh, to start to poison or make sick uh, the officials so they couldn't do their job. And she also, uh, it, it was in another scheme of hers, was to not allow, to basically take over Wasco County by uh, political means, by outvoting and basically electing as the officials all Rajneeshis. Well, yeah, I mean, you get enough, you know, population in that area and can vote, you know, you can basically appoint anybody you want. Yeah. So it was, she smeared this, you know, they basically smeared that, that mixture, this salmonella in uh, all the fixtures in the men's and women's restrooms, you know, and that's how they got it just from touching the, the doorknobs and things like that. It got them that sick. So it was a pretty scary, uh, pretty bad stuff. Mm. So Man. they did that in uh <laughs> in the Dalles, and Sheila said in one of her quotes, it says, let's have some fun. That's what she said as they 
went out to poison these people. Yay! Yep. <laughs> and they poured it all over different people. So, but then she wanted something that's a little more toxic because she actually wanted to kill a couple people. One in their plans was to kill Vicatia, the governor, uh, Dave Fromheyer, the uh, attorney general, and also the guys I mentioned earlier that was the uh, county commissioner of, of Wasco. They wanted to kill all those people as as uh, <laughs> just to make a statement that they're in charge now. And that's how close we were, um, because they tried. They that was that was their plans. That's what they wanted to do. I mean, that's like psychopath. I mean, that's like crazy psychopath type. Oh yeah. I mean, how do they think they could get away with that? I mean, all of a sudden, all these people start dying. It's like, oh, what a coincidence! All these people, you know, died at the same yeah. time. Well, here's here's the account from Bill Hulse. So. Unbearable stomach pain to rouse Bill Holst from his sleep. The Wasco County Commissioner ran for the bathroom, vomiting. His wife worried. Uh, his wife insisted he go to the hospital where doctors admitted him as they tried to diagnose what was wrong. Mm. Uh, Ray Matthews stayed in bed alone for two days, unsure that he the, what was causing his violent sickness. But a fan full of Rajneeshis knew. See, they had poisoned him the day before, and so here were two prominent figures. Um, and they had put this into their water, this potent bacteria in their water, and it got them sick. And Hulse had to be in the hospital for four days. And the doctor said he would have died without treatment, but he later recovered. And um, and wow. he he the Rajneeshis poisoned him and basically tried to kill him. So pretty crazy. Now, does that account? Does those accounts come from this lady that came out of it, or is that where do they get that information from? All this. Well, he, you see, he had actually went there the day before, and they offered him water. Oh. And that's the only thing he had, he had drank. And they do know that they poisoned the Dows. That was found out for sure by witnesses. And other people said that, yeah, that was in the workings to do this. So I don't think they ever confirmed it, but people said that that's what, what happened. But they don't think they ever found out exactly who did it. But basically, the Rajneesh said that they were... It was a simple act of human kindness on a sweltering day. What? That's the PR Rajneeshi PR person said, um, and said that Hulse was just making a hysterical accusation that he was poisoned. Oh but both people that were there and drank that water got violently sick. So it was probably pretty apparent that they were, you know, poisoned by those people. Yeah. And. Apparently, that poison was just the revenge for restricting their growth at their mm -hmm. Rancho Rajneesh, is what they called it. Mm. And they would hope that the sick and public officials would just, you know, stop bugging them and just let them do whatever they wanted. So, pretty crazy what they did. Um, so, but that wasn't it. You know, they poisoned people, but that wasn't the, the last scheme. The next scheme that, that Sheila had in her works uh, was to pack the Rolls Royces with new loyal voters to the Rajneeshis. Now, you see, most of the Rajneeshis were not U.S. citizens, so they couldn't vote. So they had to bring in U.S. citizens that actually lived in Wasco County. So um, what they did is they took buses, because they owned a bunch of buses, went out to big cities and picked up homeless people and said, okay, and they did they this to hundreds and hundreds of homeless people. And they'd say, we'll give you free drugs, uh, free food, free beer. All you got to do is come with us, live in our commune, and vote. And that's what they did. Isn't that what the Democratic Party still does to this day? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They learned it from Rajneeshis. <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah, so that's what they did. They uh, they trucked these people in, um, and um, every what they would do, they'd they'd sit in the bus. Yeah. Every time a person from Wasco County went in to vote, they'd send two homeless people in to vote, and they do this all day. And they just sit in the sit in the in the the big bus. And these are full you know right. full sized eighty person buses, AC and all that, and so they're basically trying to win by political means by you know really it isn't voter fraud because those people <laughs> did move there they moved them there the night before yep. in buses well, so it was yeah. completely legal it's all legal yeah it's all legal it's <laughs> so. yeah I, I saw the uh you can watch a video on this where they actually show these guys being trucked in and 
and they're interviewing some of these guys and these guys are like and, and they you know treat them really nice at the Rajneesh facility they got a disco going on and buffet and and these guys are like man I, I'm staying here this place is all right pretty women disco music gambling you know heck I, I could uh, hang out here for a while and then it all changed you know he swept that rug right out from underneath them and told them to get to work the next week after they voted oh yeah yep like every one of those homeless people left in the end like i mean there was very very few that, that stayed behind yeah it, it, <laughs> it was crazy and and you know they just they just charted these buses all over the United States, they just they use Shiva's American Express card, <laughs> chartered buses in cities coast to coast, filling them with homeless people, mostly men, and they said that they were hauling them to the Rancho Rajneesh was a humari- it was a humanitarian initiative. Yeah, free land, free food, free sex. Yeah, that's they said. Free drugs. Yep, those lured to buses were promised food, beer, and rest. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, they, they so, got them all drunk. They had all kinds of like uh, open bars, and you know. Yeah, so they had their own voter registration booth at the Rancho Rajneesh. So they got them all registered that the day they got in there. Oh, yeah, convenient! And they were all vo- expected to vote the party ticket, and that's exactly what they did. Um, but they quickly discovered that a lot of the homeless people they brought in had serious mental problems, and. Uh oh. Even though the ranch was was founded on love and freedom, it really wasn't a place for an unruly mob. So there's fights breaking out, and you know these crazy people who were you know probably possessed by demons of their own. They had to inject them with tranquilizers and hay doll, put hay doll into their beer kegs, um, just to keep them you know in a state of you know a sedated state. So they basically drugged up all the homeless too to keep them under control. So they had it all worked out. They put fluoride in their wine bottles. Yeah. <laughs> so it was crazy. They did all these different things. And at, at one time, there was the, a guy named Felton Walker. So, see, there was an eavesdropping monitoring system uh, at the ranch. And they had bugged public pay phones and recorded uh, one of the homeless men had apparently planned to kidnap the guru. And this uh, homeless guy was named Felton Walker and they took him to the Rajneeshi Medical Clinic and they were supposedly supposed to test for tu- tuberculosis uh, but the clinic had been emptied by patients by the time he arrived and, and as they uh, as he changed into a, to a hospital gown uh, someone taped his arm to the gurney rail and they put him to sleep with an injection and they, had, they administered sodium pentothal to him. That's the shrew serum. And Sheila basically questioned this guy to try to figure out if uh, wow. what he who had asked him to to um, kill the guru. And they did this for till about 3 a.m. And they finally gave up because they didn't get any information out of him. But uh, they sedated him for two more days and then just kicked him off the ranch. So I think the the Rajneesh and Sheila were very uh, Concerned that the that the government was wow. uh, trying to their own covert actions to try to kill the uh, the Bhagwan, which who knows? <laughs> I don't think there's any evidence of that, but that's what they believed. Hmm. Interesting. Now the 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 bad thing was is that all these homeless people, after their voting had been done, they really had no use for them on the ranch anymore. So uh, they just put them on buses and dropped them off in cities in Oregon, like Madras. So I had all these penniless people, half of them crazy, that were just dumped off in the middle of town. Hundreds of them, you know. Can you imagine that? That all of a sudden there's a hundred more bums in your in your in your town, and that's the yeah. they, they dropped them off in Madras, and there's still bums Shh. living in Madras that are from this dumping that the Raji did, you know, from 1985. I bet, yeah. No. Well, wow, well, you know, they don't have any money to get get out of there. You know, once they're dropped off, if they're homeless, how what are they supposed to do? Oh, yeah. So this really got the state, um, you know, ready for anything. And they, uh, they were starting to do operations with the National Guard where they could call up, they could mobilize about 10,000 soldiers if necessary to storm the, the commune if they needed to. Well, they... 
you know, the government probably doesn't want competition. They're using the same tactics as them. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, but luckily, Vicatia and Dave Frohmeyer, they invited uh, the governor, uh, the, the Rajneesh invited those, the governor to the ranch. Uh, so he said, hey, come to the ranch. Let's talk. Let's get this figured out. Because, again, Sheila was still speaking and, and very witty and playing the PR game so like so many of our uh, public officials do today. And uh, she wanted to, you know, hey, let's let's work together to to fix this problem. I think we could come to some kind of a compromise, you know, saying things like that. But neither of them would come there. So they were looked at as enemies now of their commune as well. So the let's make a deal uh, plan didn't work for her. And that was in the fall of 1984. Hmm. So Vicatia, he was the Republican, second term uh, uh, governor of Oregon. You know, he... He didn't want to go visit for Yeah. For one, he didn't quite trust him. I can see why. <laughs> yeah. So, see, she wanted Vikatia to face, to dispose of the three major problems that were faced in Rajneeshis. And if he did those three things, she would take care of the thousands of homeless people that had been imported to Oregon. Yeah. And just swing the, the, the elections. Um, but he wouldn't give her an appointment. So... What he did do is he sent a guy named Jerry Thompson uh, for a secret night meeting at a state office building in downtown Portland. And so Sheila did come with uh, Swami Krishna Deva. <laughs> and again, that's a guy. Yeah. And a lot of uh, police, because they didn't quite know what was going to happen. And they did meet in the middle of the night in Portland. And um, Thompson, he was well aware that Sheila was very volatile and she wanted to set the rules. But he said, look, we're going to not get any shouting, no profanity, because she often used profanity when she would uh, give her little speeches. Um, and then Sheila talked about her demands. She said uh, she wanted the governor to help clear up the visa troubles so that the guru could avoid deportation. Because, see, Bhagwan was almost going to be deported because he hadn't cleared the proper visas to get in the country oh. and if if she did that and the state and the state dropped its uh, course case uh seeking to disband the city of rajneesh param uh she would uh and take care of all those land use obstacles then she would uh take care of all the homeless hmm. and thompson said no deal you know because who created that problem in the first place i mean she again was using the tactic used by our government you create a problem yeah. And then you come in, even though you created the problem. I had to solve false solution. Yeah, they tried to solve the problem. Yeah. yeah. But unfortunately, you know, our government is better at that game. So. Yeah. <laughs> they, they they knew her, her trick. Yeah. So I guess in India that worked all the time. But, they didn't want any competition to uh, use. <laughs> yeah, our government is too good at doing the, that same thing. Yeah. So. <laughs> so she started shouting and abusive and cussing and that kind of stuff and just hmm. – walked out you know so anyway uh the rajneeshis um really didn't get anywhere this way they really couldn't pull anything off with the uh with what was happening so the the next stage was that in late 1984 uh you know they were really pushed against a wall and they really didn't have anywhere to go so yeah uh by this time sheila was uh really a nervous wreck she hadn't been sleeping. She had resorted to drip line sedation because <laughs> she needed so much of it. Um, and even the Oregonian says, for her and the others, the exhaustion made their demons loom, loom more menacing than ever. What? So even though that was a uh, wow. you know, clever wordplay for a secular article, you know, that was probably really what was happening. Yeah. Their demons were looming more menacing than ever causing them to think up even more heinous plans to you know <laughs> to come about yeah 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 i mean it's just so creepy how this kind of like it reminds me of like hitler's ideology and his minions that he had around him to do his dirty work so that he didn't get his hands dirty or whatever himself you know but um, it was all kind of based around the same ideologies of creating this new man, this enlightened new utopian world, uh, you know, and the ends justify the means, basically. And, uh, you know, Hitler 
had something else in in common with this Rajneesh guy is the fact that they believe they both believe that people were work together based in a unified hatred rather than a unified love. And he would actually even uh, appeal to uh, Hitler's teachings through Mein Kampf and, uh, and that we could unify much easier uh, through this unified hatred toward an idea rather than the idea of any type of unified love. Oh yeah. You know, and you know, that kind of goes to the kind of the last, you know, cause they were already on the way out. So, you know, Sheila was kind of fog brained at this time, fatigued. And she, she reasoned somehow that if they destroyed the county planning department's office they wouldn't be able to stop them from building so sheila gathered about a half dozen uh to go over photographs and maps of the house that had been converted into the offices at wasco county and they decided to torch it so that's what they did they burned uh burned this place down um uh, and what they did was kind of what, what here, here's kind of the operation this uh a guy one of them named ava drove the team east of the freeway freeway to the dalles and about midnight dropped off yogany and ognitin just blocks from duro's office the two pried open a window crawled inside and closed the drapes about an, after about an hour yogany and ogni rifled through cabinets and desks scattered government papers all about to start the fire they placed eight candles inside cardboard squares soaked with lighter fluid the parent intended the candles to act as timers igniting the cardboard once they burned down. Uh, but the two arsonists lit the candles, crept back out the window and closed it, but that starved the candles of oxygen and only two fires started. So they didn't actually end up burning it because most of them weren't criminals. They didn't know how to do criminal acts. They were just yeah. doing what they were told to do. Sure. You know? So they did burn down one of the computers and do some other stuff, some damage, but um, again, they tried to they tried to to burn a house down, to a uh, government office down, so that they couldn't stop them. And by this time, the the feds had come into here, and they were talking about jail time and um, saying that they had done all these things uh, illegally and all kinds of crazy things. And basically, it was costing the the ranch um, nearly a million dollars um, in extra costs. So they were basically losing all their money because they were still had a huge uh, commune in India and, but they were, they were running out of money. Remember this is very wealthy, but they didn't have a much, a lot of money to continue to do what they were doing uh, because of all the legal costs and uh, the commune costs and everything else. Mm. And it was costing them about 200 grand a month just to uh, keep it going. And yeah, so anyway, pretty crazy what happened here. Um, wow. And the last straw was murder. And they actually planned a murder. Hmm. In this one, you know, she had she had asked, uh, uh, and again, where's the Bhagwan in all this? The Bhagwan is probably directing all this from the secret chamber, even because he never speaks. Behind the scenes. No one in Oregon had ever seen him speak. They'd seen pictures of him. He just comes out. Nods, yeah. kind of shakes around a little bit, you know, his hands moving and weird gestures, and but he never speaks. He's like the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, you know, he's just sitting there. <laughs> so Sheila was doing all this dirty work for him, but she loved it, I think, anyway. I mean, so sure, she wanted the attention. Yeah, I mean, she was she was exhausted, and 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 for four years she'd done all the bidding for the Rajneeshi because he wanted this international commune. So on May 1985, uh, all the presidents of the commune, its investment corporation and its medical operation, uh, they all met and they were going to secretly execute one of Sheila's plots. And um, after Sheila spoke, another leader gave what amounted to be a pep talk supporting Sheila. She had a startling action. And so, what did, but one of the women, one of the leaders said, I can't kill anybody, hmm. but I can support you if you do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they, again, these people were not killers, yeah. but look where it was leading to. Again, this type of cult always leads to insanity, to murder, to death. Yeah. 
And so Sheila, what'd she call him? She called him cowards and cussed at him and did some other stuff. He goes, don't you love the Bhagwan, you cowards? Wow. He goes, you need to do whatever it takes to keep this, to keep this commune going. So, so again, this is just causing more mistrust among the insiders and the leaders. So, um, it was just getting crazy. So, you know, they had exploited the homeless. They had set fire to the county building. Um, they cut the, the, uh, the, you know, the Oregon, Oregon taxpayers, you know, basically spent a hundred grand to bustle these people back to their cities of origin. So Oregon actually took care of the homeless people too. They didn't get all of them, but all of them that wanted to go back, they sent them back to wherever they, so it cost to Oregon Texas a hundred grand. So, <sighs> The Rajneeshi didn't fix that problem. So, but now they're saying, well, why should we murder? We've done all these other things. Nothing's worked. Now we're going to kill somebody? How, what good is that? Gonna do? Yeah. So, anyway, they were going to target a guy named Charles Turner, who was the U.S. attorney for Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, and his, he, his prosecutors were investigating the immigration fraud at the commune. And so they thought if they killed Turner, that that would derail the investigation. You know, just kill him and it'll just go away. You know, again, I don't know if that's, you know, how things were done in India. You know, you just kill one guy and everything just goes good. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, so anyway, they, uh, what happened is that they, uh, uh, the plan involved buying a gun uh, to gun him down on his way home. So one of the assassins traveled uh, to the, uh, uh, bought pistols mm -hmm. from another country that couldn't be traced. They bought, they brought him in on the plane back then. There was no nine 11 stuff. So you could bring things in your suitcase. Um, and the other set up a safe house in Portland and that was their base scout for watching Turner. So this Turner guy, he was the, they just watched him for a while and they watched him sipping coffee. They monitored his movement. They figured out what he's going to do. So they had a plan to gun him down in the parking garage. Uh, but they couldn't figure out an easy escape route yet. So, and they also targeted a second guy, Dave Fromheyer. He was the state attorney general. Hmm. And so they figured out where he lived. Um, they had one Rajneeshi pose as a Bible salesman. <laughs> wow. To reach his front door. And the other st staked out uh, Fromheyer's office in Salem. And, and then also a team of three went to Portland to kill a guy named James Comey. And he... Uh, uh, as he lay in the St. Vincent Hospital, that was the guy uh, from ear surgery. He, had, he had, was in surgery, and he was the Was Wasco County Commissioner um, who had been critical of the Rajneeshis and, and kept up his criticism after the you know, so They had these three people that they were going to kill. So they wanted to kill all these people. They are also going to kill the guru's personal doctor because she didn't like what they were doing. And they thought, so this is one of the reasons why a lot of people think that the Bogwan didn't know what was going on because his personal doctor didn't want them to do this. But hmm. could have been that he didn't tell her about it, which is probably the case. If he was aware, he's not going to tell other people. He's using them as, as a, uh, yeah. uh, a barrier for him to not be in trouble. Yeah, no, these people are, are basically set up to be the fall guy and scapegoat, you know, so these higher-ups don't ever get in trouble. Yeah. Falls right in line with this, someone like this Sheila gal. And there was another person that they were supposed to kill, uh, Vivnik. And what they are going to do with this Vivnik guy is to, uh, they were going to go late at night. Uh, Vivnik was a gal, and it was going to be killed by a lady named Susan Hagen, who had been given a new name called Mom... Ma Anad Ava, and she was a investment banker, <laughs> and now she's going to carry out murder. And their plan was to uh, have ether soaked rags render the person unconscious, um, so that they could then kill her with a lethal injection. And they trimmed their fingernails so that if the person fought, that no skin would go underneath their fingernails, and they wouldn't cut her with anything. So they had it all planned out. They had a, you know, they there was definite intention to mm. to do all these wow. different things. And just by um, circumstance, none of these things actually happened. They did uh, jab a guy with a syringe, mm. um, but he was able to pull it out before they injected it. So, <laughs> wow. So they were posing as um, 
uh, for the guy that was in the hospital posing as nurses. And he almost got, he almost died from that injection, but they didn't get enough. It, they actually, I guess they did get a little bit. It was actually an adrenaline ejection, but they didn't get enough in him to kill him. They're basically trying to make his heart uh, go crazy. Creepy. But he was able to pull that out because he said, what are you doing? You know, because he wasn't due for something. So all kinds of things like this. But you can see how, th- I mean, it's just getting crazier as you go, um, going from uh, with all the things that happened. Now, didn't they, like, bring in a huge security uh, staff and all these machine guns and stuff as well? Well, they did. Uh, at the end, they were actually guarding the Bogwan with, mach- there was guys with machine guns they would sit next to the stage next to him with their rifles pointed upwards. Yeah. Um, you know, luckily it didn't come to, but you know, you, it, it could have easily, if there was, you know, a crazy person out there that tried to do something, they could have just started shooting everybody, Yeah. you know, and luckily it didn't come to that, but this was probably very close. This was a very, you know, you think of the Jim Jones, uh, oh, totally. type thing. I mean, these guys did all kinds of things. You know, they had the largest biological terrorism attack in U.S. history, poisoning 700 people. They ran the largest illegal wiretapping operation ever uncovered. Um, they had the biggest immigration fraud um, ever. Mm. And, you know, and those are just, the th- you know, those are just some of the things they did. And um, then there's global manhunts for these people. They, they basically fled the country. And um, basically nothing ever happened to him. Osho um, never got deported back to the United States. He did spend about 12 days in custody in, in, in the United States. Was never jailed permanently. He was allowed to go back. And uh, Sheila, who basically took the fall, left the country and never was deported back here. So she is uh, still wanted but and still alive, but will never... Um, is never gonna nothing's ever gonna happen to her. So, Man. crazy times, you know that this happened in a state that you know we live in right now, and in a place where people that are just everyday, you know, regular folk, and something like this came into their, uh, you know, right in their backyard, and just how quickly it happened, you know, in, a, in three years. There was 2,000 people yeah. in a small town, and they did all these different acts just to keep their dream alive. Man, I, well, I think it's just kind of a foreshadowing of, of you know, these things that are happening all over. There's microchasms of these same type of groups happening, I think, all over the world in different variety, different forms of just, you know, People desperate for meaning, desperate for purpose, desperate for somebody who, who has answers. And a lot of these Eastern thoughts, especially the, the Hindu type uh, ideologies, call for a guru. Um, they're always told that you know you need to find a guru, an enlightened one, and that's the only way yeah. to uh, you know actually reach that point of enlightenment is to find your guru, and, and they will give you a personal chant or uh, and name you a special name, you know, all these things that appeal to the ego and, and then tell you to do all these works and become a servant of them. And eventually maybe you can work your way up to uh, these levels of enlightenment. Or, or, but that could be millions and millions of lives. You know, I, I heard it described once as, uh, you know, these people say, well, how long until I become enlightened, you know, guru? And the guru said, well... You'll have to live as many lives as it would take as a, for an eagle if he was carrying a, a scarf and uh, the scarf touched the tip of a mountaintop <laughs> uh, every time he flew by and he'd fly by once in a lifetime. So it would take as long for that mountaintop to become a valley you know, just by that <laughs> scarf touching it once a lifetime. <laughs> And wearing it down into a valley. So that's how many lifetimes oh, yeah. you have to live before you'll be enlightened. So hang in there. You know, and you know, and they actually, they actually, the ones that thought of the Al Qaeda bombing, that was actually revealed when court records finally came, were finally released just a few years ago, about all these things that happened. Because for, you know, 20 years, people didn't know it wasn't until 2014 
earlier this year when a lot of these things were finally released that they had actually planned to uh, fly in a bomb laden plane into the county courthouse in the Dallas. And this is 16 years before Al Qaeda used planes as weapons. Wow. So that was in their plans. They had that in writing of something that they were going to do. <laughs> so they were, you know, you talk about things that they were willing to do. It was very close to a lot of bad things happening. Just who knows why a lot of these things failed. They just did. Hmm. Wow. But yeah, I mean, that was, you know... <laughs> You know, interesting story. So, very interesting story. Yeah, I mean, right in our neck of the woods. And it's one of those things that I think most people have never even heard of. You know, you may have heard the name Rajneesh or whatever, but the entire story uh, is is uh, a whole other thing. And you can go online, for those of you who want to uh, know more, you can go online and, you know, you look up Rajneesh. Uh, you can find all kinds of different uh, documentaries on it and whatnot that will tell the whole story and, and have footage of these different uh, events. It's just really spooky stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. So, you know, it's just, you know, like I said, there's, um, you know, younger kids that I talked to, or not even kids, I mean, you know, kids in their 20s say, hey, have you ever heard of, There's, in fact, there's a, one of our coaches is from Dufer. And remember, Dufer is one of the towns where they had staked out uh, to take pictures of the county commissioner, and I said, hey, have you ever heard of the Rajneesh? He said, no. Who's that? Huh. So he's never even heard of him. It was in his, where he grew up. Amazing. Um, and, you know, that's just, uh, <laughs> that's how quickly we forget. Sure, yeah. Oh, and that's kind of what's incredible. Uh, you know, like you said, they this group is bigger than ever, but here locally, they're the you know, their cover's been blown. The gig is up. You know, it's like you don't see – there's not a Rajneesh temple in Antelope, right? No. None of these people that were so into it were able to actually uh, make that work. And that's, you know, time and time again, these these communes and different places that where a lot of people have the best of intentions, especially usually the followers, not always the guru themselves or the, the leaders and self-appointed specialists, but the followers a lot of times have, you know, good intentions. They want some sort of connection, some sort of community, uh, some sort of family uh, uh, that can love them and that they can love. And, and that's the sad thing about it is how many people are duped that are, you know, maybe not active participants, but just, you know, seeking some sort of uh, truth. Yeah, 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 that's exactly right. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we have kind of selective memory on certain things. So sometimes it's good to remember how quickly something like this could happen. And with technology coming into play uh, and advanced brainwashing techniques could be done with the use of technology, who knows how quickly a population could be taken over. Unless we're grounded, you know, like the boss says, the elect yeah. could be deceived, you know, if it were possible, even the elect could be deceived. So that means anybody that's not will be deceived. Yeah. You know, there's no way they can stop from not believing the lie. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, and especially once you start adding signs and wonders and uh, actual tangible experience, which I think, yep. you know, is, is the one thing a lot of these groups have in common is these, these counterfeit tangible experiences that these people think this is it, you know. And just because you experience something you've never experienced before that's tangible and seems supernatural, there, there may be all kinds of tangible supernatural experiences out there, but that doesn't mean that that is uh, truth. That just is something different. You know, it's it's like how different chemicals can affect you or different drugs. You know, people can take all different types of drugs and, you know, you could take that to be some, I'm here in heaven, you know. And all of a sudden it's like, uh, no, you just took a chemical, you know, or no, you just followed this guru to Antelope, Oregon and, you know, started jumping around until you lost your, you know, wits. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. there's all kinds of ways yeah. That, uh, you know, the, the spirit realm is, has, through uh, thousands and thousands of years of practice, been able to deceive people through these counterfeit familiar spirits. And it's just about being familiar with with uh, oh, yeah. yep. the wants and desires of human 
Human nature. Exactly. So, well, what do we got next on the agenda? Do you have anything in the works for uh, upcoming podcast, or have you heard anything from listeners on what uh, what might be they, they be interested in? Yeah, yeah. No, I've been hearing from a lot of people. You know, I know we've been haven't had a podcast in a while here, so a lot of people have been asking and, and giving the advice. I've had uh, two or three people even get a hold of me uh, offering to give their testimonies about their own experiences. Yeah. You know, the other thing uh, that's that's coming up, and I think some of our listeners know, is, is Kent Hovind. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. he will be released. You know, he's been in prison, you know, false in my opinion. Um, totally. But he's, you know, he's been ministering in, in prison, but he's a guy that's, uh, that's changed a lot of people's lives, and prayer for Kent Hovind. Yeah, definitely keep that in our, in our, everyone's prayers because he's, uh, yeah, I know he's a great inspiration to me and, and a lot of people. Yep, definitely. Well, great. Thanks. Thanks, Zark. Yep. I'll definitely uh, try to do more podcasts here and not have so many breaks. I know I've got, like I said, got lots of ideas of different things you can do. We just got to find the time to do them. So keep us in your prayers, everybody, and uh, definitely appreciate your support. In, in everything we're doing so yeah uh tonight we're going to close out with a song called bow down uh by uh, our group destiny lab we actually just had a video made by uh, michael myers for this song if you go to youtube and look up bow down by destiny lab uh this song is quite fitting uh, until next time uh thanks for joining us everybody and good night good night I don't really want to jump to conclusions But I got a feeling the world is living in delusion Lost and confused are so many of our youth In tune with evolution so they're missing the truth Refuse of atheism and whatever they choose We knew there'd be division from them breaking the rules Isn't it sufficient that he gave us the clues? Insisting in a visit from the king of the Jews Refuse to recognize the parallels and views Alluding to the fact that God is not amused When we do not worship him but what we buy and use, pretending to ignore that which our conscience views. Tell our kids are just like animals and apes and zoos. Then we wonder why our churches have these empty pews. As soon as they believe the knuckle dragon baboons, they can act like animals because they got the excuse. Lock your doors, I'm afraid that there's monkeys on the loose. Assuming this is true, the only thing that counts is you. Bow down, give them all the care of his due. You might as well worship an idol with what you do. You worship what you got, what you buy, and what you do, and why wouldn't you? If all that counts is you, bow down, give the golden calf his due. You might as well worship an idol with what you do. You worship what you got, what you buy, and what you do, and why wouldn't you? If all that counts is you. What's it gonna take to admit our mistakes? Awaken to the fact that we've all been played. Persuaded to embrace ideas we once were apes. And amoebas are related to the human race. It's amazing that we bought into this whole charade. Made to think that there's no God and we cannot be saved. It's evaded education like a deadly plague. And degraded many minds of any hope enslaved. By the sins they are just driven by the rage and shame. Instead of his forgiveness it's a ball and chain. That they carry with them daily life. Like their favorite thing It's no wonder kids are craving what they should disdain Is there something in the water or the drugs to blame? Or is there something deeper that we can't explain? With crazy zombie people who might eat your face It makes me think that we are living in the last of days It seems like sin is growing and invading brains People acting like that golem with this precious ring Bow down, give the gold that calf is due You might as well worship an idol with what you do You worship what you got, what you buy and what you do and why wouldn't you, if all that counts is you? Bow down, give the golden calf his due. You might as well worship an idol with what you do. You worship what you got, what you want, and what you do. And why wouldn't you, if all that counts is you? I have been a one worlder all my life. I believe in it. I believe in a one a global village. So all this language is all leading us into a, a new way of living, and it's wonderful. We've got to allocate dwindling resources, or we're going to go extinct. We're going to kill each other off. It's our only chance. And how
have you notice the quickening of things taking place on your planet. The quickening of the old ways being tossed out and shaken out. Because it is the earth making the way for the new energies, the new way it's going to be. The Christ Consciousness. We are going into a new era of new frequency then all of us are going to have to adjust to this because it's, it's evolution and we don't have a choice so if you know that then i guess the next thing to say is how do i prepare we genetically manipulate children to create super children which are prophets and they will make decisions for us in the future and if you find someone that can know the future they can make an informed choice they can make the right decision about the totality of our existence they can allocate resources efficiently. We call these children the Antichrist. I'm Antichrist. It's not one person. It's what you think. It's not on the forehead. It's in the forehead. This is going to bring us this energy that the ancients called the serpent energy. And Gaia is going to be a conduit for this energy that is going to be activated through the grids on Mother Earth from the sun. And once the grids are activated and the serpent energy starts moving through Gaia, I think that this energy is going to be everywhere. And we are going to be a conduit for this energy. And if we've done the work, then perhaps we're going to be lucky enough to enlighten. For I don't think everyone will enlighten. I just think that's going to be for a very few people that have done the, all the work. Certain individuals that do the work are the perfect conduit for this serpentine energy that comes up through the Mother Earth. Snakes started coming in through the jungle. I had visions of snakes and they would look at me and then immediately start savagely like going inside my body and like eating my organs, like going down my throat and eating their way out and like exploding through my body. And I know enough from psychedelic experiences to just witness and allow and just let it happen, you know. But then it just continued to build. And so what happened next is this giant organic flotilla of like snakes and feathers comes, like a giant, kind of like an organic mothership comes. And it hovers over my head and it's living. It's a living, it's like a living mothership, right? And it starts sucking black smoke out of my body. That method trip to me connects you to the spirit world. And the idea is that there is a world that is all around us all the time, but we just cannot tune into it. And there's a world of souls and there's a world of the afterlife and there's a world of non-embodied entities that are to the experiencer, to the to the subjective person that's having this experience. They're as real, if not more real, than this life itself. Very similar with UFO abductees who are abducted repeatedly for their hybrid offspring. If you go back to the Middle Ages, you'll find that fairies were renowned for abducting people, uh, that they were sometimes cruel and tortured people, but they also sometimes gave people gifts. Uh, including healing powers, that they could fly, that they had aerial vehicles. Well, this is very common in fairy lore. And when fairies abducted you, they would quite often take you underground. And uh, my body felt very intimidating. Um, just, it was, it was like vibrating, buzzing. And uh, then I started to see like big bugs, like these huge like ants and spiders. Like, crawling across my vision, with my eyes open and then closed. I feel my body like, just become possessed and just taken over with the spirit of ayahuasca. Ayahuasca can bring you to a state.